Okay, thanks, Gina. Um, let's see, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, so I hope you can see my first slide. Um, okay, so welcome to Grow Your Own Evergreen. Um, my name is Michelle Morgan. Uh, I'm the technical support analyst at Noble, the North of Boston Library Exchange uh, in Massachusetts, north of Boston, obviously. <laughs> and we're a consortium of uh, public and academic libraries. Um, we have about, oh, I should have looked up this number. We have about um, 25 members. Uh, okay, so um, why do you need your own evergreen? Um, well, maybe you don't really need one, but you might get to the point where you feel like you need one, like I did. <laughs> uh, you might want to do some test driving and learn about the system. Um, there might be some functionality that you want to explore, um, see if you can use it for your system. Um, when a new release comes out, you might want to take that for a test drive. Um, my main interests were um, working on launchpad bugs, testing and confirming launchpad bugs, signing off on them, um, and eventually, hopefully, to fix some. Um, the Evergreen community often provides test servers per, for people to log into. There are community demo servers but you don't really have full access to those and you have to be mindful that you're sharing those with other people. Um, you don't wanna interfere with what other people are doing on them and you don't want what they're doing to interfere with what you're interested in testing. Um, so um, the, one of the good reasons to grow your own system is it's yours. Uh, you can get under the hood, you can try things you wouldn't on other systems that you use regularly or have access to. You wouldn't want to just try things on a production system. Not a good idea. Um, you can break it. It won't bother anybody else. Uh, and if you do break it, you can just throw it away and start over. Uh, and it's a great learning opportunity to get actually, you know, into the code, into the system, look around um, and play with stuff. So what uh, skills do you need to build your system? Well, that kind of depends on your goals. There's the, uh, the new devs page has been mentioned a few times uh, during this conference and it's a great place to start. It's, um, here's the link to it is on this slide, um, wiki.evergreenils.org slash, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. You can click on it from the presentation. Um, it's a great place to, um, to look for tools for if you're inexperienced with um, working with servers and Evergreen. Um, a shout out to Taryn McKenna who uh, started the group and is sort of the, the head of the group and she's very organized and puts together great programs and records great information on this page. So it's a good place if you're unfamiliar with some of the things we're talking about, start here and you'll find some good information. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so a few specific skills which are good to have. Um, being familiar with the command line interface is really important. Because um, a lot of work when you're building your system is on the com command line interface. Uh, so just being comfortable there is a good thing uh, to get some experience in. Uh, navigating Linux file systems is a plus, definite plus. Um, not some knowledge of SQL, especially if you're going to get into um, really digging into the system to see how it works. Um, a little knowledge of IP addresses and basic networking is a good thing. Many of the problems that I had along the way were because my uh, wireless network was not always happy about giving me an IP address for my server. So I would, I would lose connectivity. Um, so it's, it's good to know how to recover from that. Um, 
and knowledge of Git for testing, signing off, and fixing launchpad bugs. So how do we build our system? <clears throat> well, we could do it the traditional way. Um, find a machine, install an operating system on it, Ubuntu or, or Debian. Um, and then we could follow the installation instructions that are always on the Evergreen download page um, where the new releases are posted. Uh, so if you follow that link, you get something like this. Um, but but don't don't read it too too closely because that's not what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do instead is build a a virtual Ubuntu server on our desktop or laptop. Um, for me, it's the same machine that I use to do my daily work. Um, it does not have to be. Um, and then we're going to install Evergreen on the VM virtual machine that we just built using scripts that are, are made to do all the work, all the hard work. Uh, so why do we want to use a virtual server? Because you can run it on your workstation. You don't need a special piece of equipment. Well, we'll talk a little bit about how special it needs to be. Uh, low overhead. Um, it's uh, the virtual uh, machine software. You install it on your system. You run it like any other program. So in that sense, it's, there's a low overhead. You can start it up when you need it. You can close it when you don't. Um, one of the things I really like about it is that you can save the state of your server. Uh, if you're in the middle of something and you get to the end of the day um, and you need to close it down, you can say, freeze this just the way I had it, close it down. And when you bring it up the next day, it will be in exactly that same state as it was when you left it. <clears throat> uh, you can build multiple servers. I have certainly had trouble having more than one open at the same time, mostly because IP address conflicts, I think. But you can do work on one, save that, have another one that you're doing another project on. Um, so you can have multiples that exist at the same time but are not running at the same time. Um, and virtual servers are disposable in a good way. Um, these servers will come to the end of their life, especially like when a new release comes out. Um, that's a good time to throw it away and build a new one. Um, another good time to throw it away and build a new one is when you break it, which I've done many times. <laughs> um, a note about the workstation that you build your virtual servers on, it needs to be pretty powerful. <clears throat> Currently, I have a, a laptop running Windows 10. Uh, it's got an i7 processor and 32 gigabytes of RAM, which is really nice. Um, it's uh, My workstation was provided by Noble. And it's my, I got it sometime during this long year when who knows what happened to time. <laughs> uh, but it was an upgrade from a laptop with an i3 processor and eight, eight, gig, excuse me, eight gigabytes of RAM, um, which I was running virtual machines on, uh, but it was, it was a little too much for it. And moving into this more powerful laptop was like moving from a tiny studio apartment to a like 4,000 square foot luxury house. So it was really nice. <laughs> uh, OK, so what will we need to build our machine? You need a platform for your virtual machine. I am using VirtualBox. There are others. Uh, you need a, uh, an image of the Ubuntu server that you'll be installing on your VirtualBox. And you will need um, a script to do all the work of installing Evergreen. I'm going to use the Ansible script. Um, I'll talk about another script um, as we go along, which is also a possibility for you. Um, so the first thing we want to do is install VirtualBox. Uh, the link is, is on this slide. And you can 
install, you can get it for Windows, Mac, Linux, other operating systems. So you choose the one that matches your operating system and install that. Uh, the script that we will be using to install is the Ansible script, which is, is, was built and maintained by Bill Erickson. Shout out to Bill Erickson. Um, and other, other community members have contributed to it too. Um, it's on GitHub uh, and the link is available on this slide. Uh, this is a snapshot from the page and note that there are uh, different scripts for different versions of the Ubuntu operating system. So you need to make sure the script matches the operating system you're installing. Um, and throughout this presentation, I have uh, screenshots that show different versions of the operating system because things change. When I first started, everything was on Ubuntu 1804, but Ubuntu comes out with a new version. So the script gets updated to the new version. So um, you just have to be sensitive to these versions that you're um, that you're working with. Um, I did want to, let's see, show the, this is a, a snapshot from the README for the Ansible script. Uh, step one is install Ubuntu 2004. Step two um, is when you pull down the, the Ansible script uh, using Git. And this uh, short list of about five or six commands is all you need to execute on your virtual machine to install Evergreen. Um, I also wanted to mention the Docker script. Um, I have not used the Docker script much. much. I started uh, testing it initially um, on my old lap laptop, but something bad happened and I moved on to Ansible. Um, my impression is that if you have less experience, you might want to try Docker. Um, on this screen from Docker, I noticed that if your Docker server is running and you press Control C, that will kill the server, which made me think, hmm, maybe Docker isn't stable enough for what I wanted to do, which was test and, and um, test launchpad bugs and sign off on them. So, but uh, if you're, if you want to explore Evergreen, Docker might be something, something good to try. Okay, so the next piece we need is the Ubuntu server installation file, which you can get from the Ubuntu website. Um, down here is a link to uh, 2004, uh, which is the current version for now. Um, so when you download that to your workstation, you'll get a file, um, an ISO file. Um, that you will use um, when we start up VirtualBox. Okay, so let's grow our evergreen. Um, first, I have a disclaimer. I am not a sysadmin. I do have a lot of experience crawling around the evergreen system. Um, I take a lot of support calls, which, which um, prompts me to find out what's wrong so that we can um, file bugs and hopefully fix them. Uh, I, there was a lot of trial and error when I was developing this process. I must have tried building probably a dozen or so machines. Um, some of them worked, some of them didn't. Um, and there may be better ways to do some of the things in this process, but it works and, and it works for me, but I'm happy to learn easier ways to do things. Um, I did find that a lot of my issues when things failed were those IP address issues, when I suddenly couldn't connect to my server or when it was building, it couldn't get out to the internet and, and pull down all the, the files it needed. Uh, okay, so we're gonna fire up virtual box. 
Um, this, when you first fire, fire it up after installing it, uh, this panel over here will be empty because you haven't created any machines yet. Um, your created machines will live here. Um, you will, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these are your machine commands across the top. Um, the first thing we're going to do is click on new to create a new machine and it will start prompting us for some things. Um, we'll need to give it a name. Uh, it will supply a folder to store the machine. I, the default is fine unless you want to change it. Um, mostly the defaults on the screen are fine, but there are some that you're going to need to change. Um, for example, uh, the memory size. Uh, I usually, this is a slider, I usually slide it to around 8 gigabytes. Um, when I did smaller ones, Evergreen didn't run very well or at all. Um, you do need to make sure that you don't give your virtual machine more memory than your your actual physical machine has, and you need to leave enough memory for your physical machine to operate while your virtual server is running. So since I have the luxury of 32 gigabytes, uh, giving my virtual machine eight is, is no problem at all. Um, so we're going to do create a virtual hard disk now and then click on the create button at the bottom of the screen. So that will give us another prompt. Um, file location, I accept the default. Um, another thing, there's a slider here to give your hard disk plenty of space. Um, I have run into problems where I didn't have enough space for Evergreen previously, so I usually go up to about 40 gigabytes, uh, and I haven't had a problem with that. Uh, again, don't give your virtual machine more than your actual machine can afford. Uh, okay, so then we click Create, and we go back to this screen. Um, one thing I've discovered that I needed to do uh, to be able to connect to my machines was go into this setting tab um, and then go over to network and for the network adapter it defaults to NAT and when I changed it to bridge adapter I had much better luck so that's what I did. Uh, okay so then we go back to our uh, virtual machine controller uh, and we click on the start button. It's going to ask a, a couple more things. Um, this is where we choose whatever ISO file we downloaded from Ubuntu, uh, the server ISO file. Uh, this screenshot was from 1804. Um, previous screenshot was 20. So just again, just be aware of your version numbers. So when we start, um, it's going to start uh, giving us the, these uh, command prompts in the terminal window. And um, to navigate through this window, you can use the arrow keys, the up and down arrow keys. Um, a space will select a box if you need to check something. Uh, and the enter key, usually you arrow down to done and, and uh, press the enter key to move on to the next screen. So on most screens, you'll just be continuing to the next screen. There are a few um, screens. Uh, there are a lot of screens because you have a lot of options when you install Ubuntu, but we don't have to worry about many of them for this. Um, this screen may give you pause, and I apologize. It's a little bit hard to read. Um, but what it says is confirm destructive action, which means it's going to format, format the disk space that you gave to it when you set up your um, virtual machine. It's not going to kill your actual machine. Everything in this relates to the virtual machine, but it did give me pause. Do I really want to do this? Yes, you do. <clears throat> um, so once you do that, you will give it some information. It wants your name. Um, you need to name your server. It doesn't have to be the same name as you gave it in VirtualBox, but 
I find it's less confusing if I do. Uh, you need to pick a username and a password that you will use to log into Ubuntu when it's built. So then we arrow down to done and press enter. Um, and the other setup piece uh, that I like to choose is to install the OpenSSH server. Um, so you put an X in that little box there. This is useful if you want to uh, connect to your server like with your favorite text editor or um, some other kind of uh, development uh, application that you like to use. You can do all your work in this terminal uh, that VirtualBox shows you, but it gets a little hard on the eyes after a while. Um, so I always install that. So at some point, um, a whole bunch of stuff will scroll across the screen. Uh, a lot of this process, the virtual machine is very busy scrolling stuff across the screen, but you can just sit back and watch it. Um, so it gets to notice up here, it says finished install. And now we arrow down and we hit reboot. <clears throat> and again, a whole bunch of stuff will scroll across the screen. And eventually we will get to a prompt that says login. So you can log into your, um, <coughs> excuse me, you using your username and password that you created before. Um, and you'll get to a screen like this. Uh, we're now logged in. Um, one thing to notice on this screen, um, the server has gotten an IP address from your network. So right here, you can kind of read it. Um, I typed it out over here. It's 10.0.2.15 for this machine. That might be different the next time you boot up your machine. Um, I know you can probably give it a static IP address, but I don't. I haven't amassed an, as much knowledge <laughs> as I would like to, to regularly do that as part of this. Haven't gotten there yet. Um, so at this point, you've built an Ubuntu system. We're halfway there. Um, I mentioned before, um, it's the end of the day, you want to savor your success for the end of the day. Uh, if you close, if you hit the X in the upper right hand corner of that terminal window that VirtualBox gives you, uh, you will get this uh, box and you can power off the machine, um, send a shutdown signal or save the machine state. And I almost always save the machine state unless I'm um, doing something that requires a restart. Uh, so I save the machine state so it will be exactly where I left it the next time I open it up. OK, so let's move on to installing Evergreen. Um, just a note about uh, users on your system. Uh, we already talked about this user. It's the one you created when you built your VM. Uh, the root user is the all-powerful user. You'll need to uh, do some, execute some commands as that user. Uh, and the OpenSurf user, uh, we don't have that yet. That will be created when we, as part of the evergreen installation process. Um, but once we run that, that's the user that owns evergreen. So many uh, commands you have to run need to be run by that user. So um, this is sort of a cheat sheet for changing users on your virtual box. Um, when you log into your server, you're logged in as your Ubuntu user. Um, to get to, you have to get to the root user to get to the OpenSurf user. Um, you could probably, not probably, definitely, you could assign the OpenSurf user a password that you know that you could log in directly, but um, knowing this process is, is useful. Um, so you execute this sudo su hyphen root command you enter your password, and that will get you to the root user. Um, su-openSurf 
will get you directly to the OpenSurf user. Uh, if you exit from the OpenSurf user, you'll go back to root. And if you exit root, you'll go back to your Ubuntu user. Um, <clears throat> so um, from the Ansible readme file, these are pretty much the commands that you'll need to install. Um, you just type them in. You wait till you get your command prompt back. Sometimes it takes a long time. Um, but eventually you'll get there. Uh, this last command right here is what actually invokes the script, which is programmed to do all the tasks uh, that will install your Evergreen. Uh, so here's a couple of snapshots of the Ansible script running. Um, again, it'll take a while and it'll keep scrolling and it'll test things. Uh, but eventually, you'll get your command prompt back, um, and that means it's done. So if you take your IP address that you recorded before uh, and go in your browser um, to http colon slash slash that IP address slash eg slash staff, you should get a login. Um, notice I have a different IP address showing on this machine. Um, I was on another network for this screenshot. That's why it's got a different address. <laughs> um, the default password for your system, um, for your test system is admin demo 123. You might be familiar with that password um, from systems that are built for bug squashing day. Um, so that's what it gets by default. So if I log in, and I'll have to register my workstation, but I will eventually get the evergreen screen um, and you're in. Uh, you can also connect to the OPAC um, just with HTTP colon slash slash and the IP address. Um, one thing about the OPAC, um, I built a new machine right after 3.7 came out and my, it's the bootstrap OPAC, which is the, the default in 3.7. And my bootstrap looked weird. Uh, so I asked on IRC and turns out there's a little missing command in, in the Ansible script uh, for the new bootstrap OPAC. And thanks to Jeff Davis, um, these two simple commands fixed it. Uh, <clears throat> so our evergreen system has the stock database um, also known as the Concerto database. Uh, there is information on what's available for logins, users, some information on the records that are in that database um, at this wiki link. Uh, so definitely it's useful to, to bookmark that link because if you have to test something and you need a user or you need to know what has parts or what has serials, uh, that's a good place to go um, to find out what to look for. So congratulations, you now have an evergreen system. <coughs> uh, so before I go on, are there any questions? Not sure how we're doing for time. I guess we're doing pretty good. Yeah, we're at uh, one thirty, so we got you know 20 minutes. Um, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plenty of time for, you know, any uh, discussion that, um, yeah, so uh, just as a reminder, there this is a recorded session, so uh, documents and um, links and so forth, I'm sure, will be also say, uh, shared, rather. Um, yeah, and I have a few, few more things to show, so um, I'll continue on. Um, feel free to ask questions as they uh, come in, and... Um, I see there was a the question about Docker on Windows, um, and that that's what I did try um, installing Docker on Windows. But and I'm going to blame my old laptop that I didn't get it to work. Um, <clears throat> so definitely, yeah, give Docker a try if you if you want. Um, so. I like to do a few extra things beyond the, the plain install. Um, one of the things I like to 
add is PHP PG admin, which is a GUI interface to the Evergreen database. Um, I, I crawl around the database all the time. Uh, I think it's a great way to learn the system. Um, when you, uh, it, it's great that the community has test systems available and um, Taryn does a great job organizing test systems for bug squashing day, but you can't get to the database in those systems and you can't, <clears throat> you can't, you can't log into those systems to, to see what's going on in the code. Um, so I always install PHP PG admin. Um, and I, I wrote myself um, a cheat sheet. All these cheat sheets, pretty much all these cheat sheets I I got from, from Google. <laughs> I was like, how do I install PHP G, PG admin? Oh, okay. Here's how I do it. Um, so the commands are here. Um, and you browse to that IP address uh, with PHP PG admin on the end um, and the default username and password for your Evergreen database is Evergreen. Um, another thing I like to do, especially since I want to get to the point where I can uh, pull down patches from um, the working Evergreen repository so I can test launchpad bugs is to set up Git. Um, setting up Git for the first time is a little bit involved. Um, I wrote a couple of commands here, the git config to sh tell it who I am and my email address, but there's a lot of good information on the new devs page um, regarding how to set up git um, and get you getting your, uh, you need to send your git keys to the git admin so that they can give you permission to uh, post your, your branches or your sign offs to the working repository for testing launchpad bugs. Um, <clears throat> I do have a cheat sheet for um, adding the working repository. When you use the Ansible script to install your system, you part of it um, it it adds the uh, the Evergreen Git repository, which is where the real Evergreen code lives, to your virtual server. Um, so when you install that, you're installing a master system, which is is the up-to-date code for Evergreen. Um, when releases are cut, uh, like 3.7 is a snapshot of the, the Evergreen code at the point where the release is cut. Um, a few patches may have been added and most likely were added since a release is cut. Um, so when you build your system, it's grabbing a snapshot of master at the time you build it. So it might be a little bit ahead of the last release, um, but that, that's not a bad thing. Uh, you just need to be aware of that. Um, so your server already knows about the evergreen repository. What it doesn't know about is the working repository that um, uh, developers push their or bug fixers or community members push their working branches to um, when they propose a patch for a bug. So this these commands will add the working repository so that you will have access to the evergreen repository and also the working repository so that you can pull down those, those patches to test. Uh, one thing I like to do after I get the system set up the way I want it uh, I don't touch it. I don't touch that original system that I just built. Um, I immediately make one or more clones. Making clones is easier than building systems. So I leave my system that I built just the way it is. And I make one or more clones that I can mess up <laughs> to my heart's content. And I can go back, always go back to that system I just built and make another clone. It just saves a lot of time. <clears throat> so a clone is an exact duplicate of the system you built. Um, and you always have that pristine system that you can go back to and reclone. Um, 
So if I want to do make a clone in VirtualBox, um, it looks like I cut off the menu on the screenshot, but there's a machine option. If I click on that, I get an option to clone. I have my machine selected here. It was Ubuntu 09 that I just built. So I click on clone um, and then it asks me, uh, I can give it a, a new name by default. It's going to say clone of whatever I cloned. Um, and I don't know, um, I always choose this generate new Mac address for all network adapters. I don't know if I have to do that, but it worked when I did it. So I keep doing it. Um, so if I go next, uh, it will ask me what type of clone I want. And I always do a full clone because my goal is to leave the system that I just built exactly as it was. If I did a linked clone, any changes I make to the clone will also affect my original system, which I don't want to do. Um, so when I say clone, we get the little, the little sheep here who's making... Um, that's my clone, I guess. <laughs> uh, and this doesn't take very long at all. Um, it maybe takes a little more time than starting and stopping your, your virtual machines, but it it's really takes um, definitely under a minute, probably under 30 seconds. Uh, OK, so when it's done, uh, we have another machine here. It's all built. It's all ready to go. It's a clone of the one I built. Um, initially. Um, I have a few more cheat sheets to share. I like cheat sheets. Uh, so on these, um, when I have a dollar sign, that means you're the open surf user. And when I have a hash, it's it means you're the root user because you have to switch users and um, execute some of these commands. Uh, I mentioned before I've had trouble with IP addresses on my servers. So I find I can use this ifconfig command and it will show me the IP address that my server has. Um, I can force my server to get a new IP address um, with these two commands. Um, this sudo, the dh client commands. Um, I have a cheat sheet for restarting Evergreen. Uh, sometimes when you pull down a patch, uh, depending on how involved the patch is, if it like if it touches a Perl module, uh, you may have to uh, pull down your patch, get it on your system using Git, put it into place in one way or another, and then restart Evergreen so that your running evergreen will see the changes in that Perl module. Uh, what else do I have? Um, Angular files. If you're just starting out with this, Angular files are probably a good place to start because you don't have to stop and start evergreen to see changes in Angular files. Um, you don't have to rebuild your system to see changes in Angu Angular files. Um, you just need these commands, which will, this first one, um, will navigate to the place where the Angular files live. Uh, the second one, the ng build hyphen hyphen prod, will compile those files. And then uh, the third one will take those compiled files and copy them into the place where the running Evergreen system uh, looks for them. And you don't even really have to do a hard refresh on your browser for the Evergreen files. Um, hard refreshes are always a good idea, but usually just a reload will let you see those changes. Um, my favorite cheat um, on my server is the up arrow command. Uh, some of those commands are pretty complicated, and if you've typed them in once, um, they'll be in your history, so you can always use your, your up arrow to find a command that you've done before and re-execute it. Uh, okay, so 
my goal for all this was to be able to, as I mentioned, is to be able to test bugs and sign off on them. So I just wanted to go over the, the process that I, I use to do that. Uh, so the first thing I do is I start my VM. Um, I navigate to home, OpenSurf, Evergreen as the OpenSurf user. Um, and that's the directory um, that Git knows about or that knows about Git. So if I'm doing Git commands, I have to be there. <laughs> um, I usually do a Git pull, which will go to the Evergreen repository and pull down the latest master code. Um, that's not always totally necessary, but I just do it as a matter of course, so it's always up to date. Um, the next thing I do is a git fetch working, which will pull down uh, the working repository, which has all the branches uh, in the launchpad bugs that you want to test. Um, so if I want to test a branch, um, I will create a new git branch. I usually, um, using this git checkout minus b command, I usually give it a branch name that is the bug number. That just works for me. Uh, and if I put the origin slash master at the end, that means the branch that I'm creating is tracking uh, the master system. So uh, if what you're doing uh, takes a little time, like a week or, or more, or if it's especially active with, patch, with um, code being committed to master, you can... <coughs> You can reconcile, um, you can always reconcile your branch with the current version of the master system if you track it. That's probably not a very good explanation, but it's the hand wavy one. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next step is uh, to find your bug, and I should have had an example bug, but I don't. Um, you need to do a cherry pick. The minus S will add your sign off. Uh, you don't know at this point that you're going to sign off on the bug, um, but if you do, you'll have the sign off there and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and then you need the first seven characters from the big long commit string um, to pull that patch into your Git branch. Um, so the next thing you need to do is make sure that the patch that you pulled down is gets to the place where your running evergreen system is using it. Um, depending on how complicated the bug is, it could involve something simple like copy the patch from one place to another on the server. Um, we talked about the Angular files already. It could be just uh, run the command to compile the Angular files and copy those into place. Uh, if it's a very complicated patch, uh, you might have to rebuild Evergreen. Um, my system manager, Martha Driscoll, gave me steps to do that once. And I did it once, but I don't have a cheat sheet for that here. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes you'll need to restart Evergreen. Um, I had the cheat sheet earlier. Um, it's always a good idea to restart Evergreen just to make sure that it's current. Um, so then you can log into your system and test the patch. Uh, so when you test patches, um, you really want to test them. You need to consider permissions, library settings, global flags, <coughs> what the staff sees, what patrons sees, and, and different workflows. Um, if it's a simple bug, like this column is labeled wrong, that's a really easy thing to test. Um, but just keep in mind that, that there can be a lot involved in testing. Um, so if everything looks good, you can use uh, the git push command to push your working branch with your sign off up to the um, working repository 
Um, and then, of course, you'd update the Launchpad bug um, and hopefully <coughs> add a signed off tag. No, you will add a signed off tag and hopefully um, very soon a committer will review it and decide whether it's um, appropriate to, to merge it to master. Um, <clears throat> so that's the process. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. So I'm happy to look at questions. And one that seemed to be answered by the chat, but I might ask it anyways. Uh, do you put your keys on your VM too? I do. Um, I copy, I, I uh, before I started the VMs, I did all my Git work in Git Bash, which is great for Git, but it's not running your system. I did, mm. I do copy my keys from Git Bash, <coughs> excuse me, to my virtual server. So I don't have to ask the Git admins to constantly give my new keys permission. Um, and I do, let's see, I didn't add a cheat sheet for that. It's a little bit involved. That's why I didn't include it here, but yes, I do do that. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions for Michelle? There's a few minutes before we go on to break. Feel free to throw them in the chat. Or as always, you could go into the open discussion forums during the break too. Continue the conversation there. All right, cool. A lot of thanks for people uh, thanking you for giving your time to us today. Oh, well, thank you. And I, I'm usually in in IRC um, or wherever IRC is going to move to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's a great resource being in IRC because you can just ask a question and somebody will answer it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give a testimony to that. Um, yeah, and this is great. I know that I've been uh, wanting to set up a test a machine as well, so I'll definitely be taking your notes. So uh, with that, thanks everybody for uh, joining us and we do have a break.